Can you believe that Oda dropped a not-so-subtle hint about the identity of the One Piece treasure through Shanks in this chapter? And that's far from the only interesting thing, because there's probably to talk about this week between Admiral Ryokuyu and what Sawa has done. We've got a lot of things to talk about, so welcome to Chapter Secrets, where we break down all the details and linguistic nuances in every One Piece chapter. Let's begin. To start things off, I'd like to focus at the beginning of the chapter with Yokuyu, or Ricardo, uh, I mean, uh, Aramaki. Uh, considering I didn't cover last time's chapter, I wanted to mention a few things about Ryukuyu himself. Of course, just like all the other admirals, in case you didn't know, Aramaki's design is based on that of a famous Japanese actor. Going down the list, Aokiji is based on famous actor Yusaku Matsuda, Kizaru on Kunie Tanaka's role in 1975's comedy Tragyaro, where he played a similarly dressed character by the name of Borsalino II, Akainu is based on Bunta Sugawara and his many Yakuza roles, Fujitora on Shintaro Katsu's famous role as the blind swordsman Zatoichi, and finally, Aramaki on Yoshiharada's role as the character by the same name, Aramaki, in 1990's samurai flick Ronin Guy. Now, the interesting thing about the admirals being based on actors is that not only are their designs taken from said Japanese actors, but their personalities are also greatly influenced too. Aokiji follows a lot of characteristics from Matsuda's roles, such as his love for women, Kizaru is based on an actor who played many comedy roles, Akainu's actor played violent, ruthless Yakuza roles, and Fujitora's character is pretty much a massive homage to Zatoichi in general. So where does that leave Yoshio Harada? Well, let me tell you about his role in Ronin Guy, as I've actually sat down and watched the entire movie for the sake of this analysis. Well, in his role in Ronin Guy, Aramaki was a brazen and reckless samurai who didn't really care about his life or those he ended up hurting. In a sense, that's actually not that far from how Ryokugyu is at the moment. However, the particular thing about Aramaki in Ronin Guy is that by the end of the movie, he ends up redeeming himself and saving the woman he falls in love with, bringing a good ending to this reckless samurai. This is kind of fitting since Oda did hint at in an SBS that both Fujitora and Ryukuku uh, could potentially end up fighting against the wishes of the world government, though whether this will actually happen or not, especially given Ryukuku's current attitude, is hard to tell. So does that mean that the same that happened in Ronin Guy will happen in the story? Uh, well, no, not really. After all, these movies are just a general guideline for the designs of the admirals and their personalities, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's how things will exactly develop. The movies are just something Oda draws inspiration from, so it doesn't need to be one-to-one, -one, but it can still be an interesting reference for what could happen. I guess we'll see soon enough within the story. Speaking about more details on Aramaki, though, the tattoo on his chest reads as Shinagawa Shinju. This is most likely a reference to Shinjuku Shinju, which is one of the more famous songs by Aramaki's actor Yoshio Harada. Shinagawa Shinju is also the story of an old Rakugo tale about a courtesan entangling her own client to commit a double suicide together, only to give up at the end. I do wonder if this reference goes any deeper in how in Ronin Guy Aramaki redeems himself to save his woman, but I guess once again we'll just have to see. Moving on to Aramaki's Dao Fruit, though, the Mori Mori no Mi, as many guess, is a plant-based Logia. This was fairly obvious to most readers for both the fact that Aramaki seems to feed himself on photosynthesis and absorbing liquids with his fruit, and the fact that all admirals have Dao Fruit powers that are related to their colors, with Ryokuyu's obviously being tied to green, as his name literally means green ox. Anyway, Mori is the Japanese word for forest, so while some will more casually refer to it as the plant plant fruit of sorts, forest forest fruit is the more accurate translation. Armaki doesn't just turn into a plant, but he is an entire forest, so it's quite fitting. The attack he uses against the scabbards is called Kinniku Mori Mori. When reading the kanji, the meaning of the attack is Forbidden Hatred Forest, as we mentioned before with the name of the fruit, you know, Mori Mori. But Kinniku Mori Mori, read phonetically, also much more simply means swelling muscles, just like his branches appear to be. Another small interesting detail is how Aramaki mentions that he's a Logia, but while he does say Logia in the phonetic reading, the kanji reading reads as nature. This is the natural spelling of Logia in the manga, as they are always written with this kanji reading, but it's doubly fitting here because Aramaki is quite literally nature himself. Also, before we move on, there's this one line that Aramaki mentions at the beginning of the chapter that the power to influence others is a power that is very hard to attain. This seems to be in reference to Luffy, which would make this statement very similar to that of Mihawk in Marineford, how Luffy has the most dangerous power in the world. Are they just referring to Luffy being a good 
influencer, or is there more to this power behind Luffy? It's also worth noting how both Yamato claiming to be Kaido's son and Momonosuke appearing in his dragon form are both very clearly shown to Aramaki. It's possible that he will take this information and head back to Marine Headquarters if he's driven off to let the world government know about it. For one, it'll likely factor on Yamato's bounty, on epithet, and for the other, the government will realize that Vekabang's fruit was not a failure, which could have really big repercussions. We then switch to the red hair pirates who are now nearby Wano. It's hard to say why exactly they are there. Shank says it's not time to fin Luffy yet. So why is he there? He could be there just to fend off any incoming ships, since Aramaki did call in a battleship last chapter, or maybe dry off the Admiral entirely himself, since uh, Aramaki is unlikely to fight an entire Yonka crew now, or at least a second one. I do wonder if this could potentially lead to a brief encounter between Shanks and someone like Momo in the scabbards, but him leaving without meeting Luffy. Anyway, what's interesting is when Shanks looks at Luffy's bounty poster and thinks back on when he stole the Dao fruit. What's tricky here is that it's hard to convey in translation whether Shanks actually knew about the fruit or not. In the original Japanese version, he says, Korega, which means this is. Uh, but the tone and meaning of it can be very influenced by the context. He could be simply thinking back that this is another power of the Gomu Gomu no Mi, or potentially he could have actually known this was the Hito Hito no Mi Model Nika all along, but we don't actually really know and there's really no way to confirm it here. We also get a look at what is evidently a young who's who trying to guard the ship, and it's interesting that his eyes are still obscured and we don't get to see them, and that he already had horns back then, indicating that his horns are real and not just cosmetic, once again hinting at the yet unnamed horned race. Unless those are meant to be the Oni. We get flashbacks of Shanks interacting with Luffy for the first time. This is after he got the Gomu Gomu no Mi from the world government, but a year before Luffy accidentally ate it when the Red Head Pirates left it lying around, according to the current timeline of events we've been given so far. This means this is the youngest Luffy has ever been in the series, at age 6. A really cool detail of these scenes is how in the background we can see a bounty poster as well. A really cool detail of these scenes is how in the background we can also see a bounty poster. This is the bounty poster of Mikio Ito, an easter egg character that can also be seen in Chapter 1, who is based on a colleague of Oda. It's also fitting that Luffy's shirt features a music note with how many times the crew used to sing being Sasaki. Also, another interesting detail is how the ship of the red-haired pirates at the time, it looks a lot like the Red Force, but it is actually a different ship entirely, as indicated by the figurehead. Or at least the Red Force before it underwent some major renovations. This is for the sake of keeping consistency, as the ship of the Red Haired Pirates in Chapter 1 did look a bit different from the Red Force now. Fascinating is also the scene where Shang shows his hat to Luffy. It's particularly fitting how he overlays it over the setting sun, which definitely fits with the symbology of the hat correlating to the sun, as many believe is the case. Uh, going back to the present, though, we get to see a member of the Red Hair Pirates who looks like a giant monkey, likely a mink, if not a devil fruit user. This is not Monster, the other monkey of the crew who is far smaller and can be seen in the previous panel. The monkey mentions how he's heard that Luffy is a monkey-like monster, but funnily enough, the shirt of the guy next to him reads as Sore omaida yo, which means, that's you, dude. And the tattoo of the other guy similarly reads, that's you, as well. After a quick mention of what Bardo did during the cover story, we have the big scene of the chapter, with Shanks claiming that it's time to go steal the One Piece. It's important to indicate that the word here is ubao, which means to steal, snatch, or seize by force. This would indicate they need to take it from someone or somewhere, but it could also just be a color way to just say, let's go grab it. However, it's also important to know that Shanks' sentence does not specify a subject in Japanese. As he says, isn't it time to go snatch it? So he could be saying that they, the red haired pirates, should go snatch the One Piece, but at the same time, it could also be someone else. Maybe he's saying it's time Luffy goes snatch the One Piece, or maybe it's time the world at large to go and try to attempt to get the One Piece. It's hard to say. I wonder if this could maybe relate with the fact that Big Mom said a part of the One Piece exists in the Wano country, and if Shanks could perhaps be referring to that in some form. Really though, the far more interesting part of this scene is how Shanks says this, as he casually 
happens to grab a cup of sake that Beckman poured him from a bottle. Hello guys, if you know me, you already know what I think about the identity of the One Piece and how that correlates to Binks' sake. If you haven't, I suggest you go check out the video in the description, but to me this just serves as yet another piece of evidence of how sake is often associated with the One Piece, ever since chapter 1 where we saw Higuma refuse one piece of sake when Shanks tried to exchange it with him. Its very focused presence here feels way too intentional to at least not be a hint of sorts. Particularly interesting is also the label of the sake as it's goban, which is a Japanese type of sake that literally just means fifth. This could potentially be a sneaky reference to Gear 5th, but I won't wonder if there is actually more to it, considering that this side of the label reads as 67 sake. Is there some hidden meaning to this? I usually don't really like to try to make these connections, but I do wonder if it could be referencing chapter 67 of the manga, which is the chapter when Sanji explains the Old Blue to Luffy, a fitting connection given the Old Blue's likely importance to the endgame of the story and the One Piece itself. Fifth could potentially be a reference to the fifth panel of the chapter when Gin stated, let's meet again on the Grand Line, which could perhaps be a reference to Shanks wanting to meet Luffy again on the Grand Line, but again, I'm just pulling at straws here. Moving on, we finally get answers for the headlines that Monergans brought up during chapter 956, almost a hundred chapters ago now. As many predicted, Sebo has assassinated King Cobra, or at least that's what the newspapers are seeing. Given how the Gorosei mentioned how the Alabaster Kingdom were traitors in chapter 908, it's quite likely that they had a hand in uh, quote-unquote racing King Cobra and framing Sabo as the killer. This also ties with the disappearance of Vivi, since King Emu was very clearly interested in her, but likely needs her alive. I'd like to highlight once again how Emu highlighted Vivi's image right next to those of Luffy, Blackbeard and Shahoshi, all massive prominent figures when it comes to the history of the world, only though he cut those last ones up and kept Vivi with him. Something doesn't quite add up though, as Koala, Ivankov and Dragon seemed shocked and heartbroken at the news of what happened to Sambo, which seems odd that they'd feel that way for just killing one king, considering how the revolutionaries have killed many people, after all. Similarly, how Makino and Dadan were also crying and heartbroken. So perhaps there were some more dramatic news at first, or there is an aspect we do not yet know. We're also told about how the revolutionaries fought and Marie Joie in classic Uda off-screen fashion, which is actually a panel we've seen before in chapter 925, but this time without the silhouettes. Furthermore, there's the attempted assassination, which appeared to be on St. Charles, but St. Miosgard allowed the criminal to escape. I don't think this is referring to the events we saw the reverie, where Charles was almost attacked by Neptune but was then hit by Miosgard, so I think it's probably something separate. It's likely this could be related to Bonnie, as she felt a deep grudge towards Charles' family for how they treated Kuma, but we need more details to say for sure. Also, we get a mention of the guards and Marijos, which are referred to as the Kamino Kisidan, or the God Knights. We're also introduced to a new Marine, Tensei, who is the chief of the Marine Criminal Investigation Bureau. The interesting thing about him is that he has a codename just like the Admirals, based on a color and an animal of the Chinese Zodiac. We had Blue Pheasant, Yellow Monkey, Red Dog, Purple Tiger and Green Ox, as well as the two Admiral candidates who had rejected, Brown Pig and Pink Bunny. But it's interesting that now we also get Black Horse, or Kurouma, so I wonder if he too was put into consideration to be an Admiral, just like Shiton and Momosagi. Given his look, it's quite likely that he too is based on a Japanese actor. This one might be a bit harder to narrow down, but my best guess is that he's based on Joe Shishido, known for many Yakuza and various roles from the 1950s to the 1970s. Finally, going back to Sabo, it seems that declaring war on the Celestial Dragons had quite the success because eight kingdoms whose kings were away during the rivalry staged coup d'etats during that period of time, which has likely started to shift the political weight in the world. We see this scene in a country where the citizens have taken over, as indicated by the weapons and the execution stage with a guillotine behind them. Fresh blood can be seen next to the guillotine, indicating that a ruler was executed, which is drawing inspiration with how the guillotine became a symbol during the French Revolution to execute the ruling class at the time. We also see a bunch of flags decorated at the sides, ranging from flag of the Revolutionary Army to the crossed out as that is featured in his tattoo, referencing Sabo. We also see a symbol of the world government logo pierced by an arrow, as well as the marine flag upside down, likely as symbols of rebellion. Furthermore, there are two swords crossed in one of the flanks, which could just be a symbol of battle, but it is awfully similar to the symbol of the Shimotsuki clan, so I wonder if there's any connection there, particularly with the fact that Koshiro seemed to actually know Dragon, as very briefly alluded to during Luffy's flashback, something Oda also hinted at in one of his interviews too. 
Anyway, Sabo himself is referred to by the world as the Entei, or Flame Emperor, which was the name of Ace's greatest attack, which he used against Blackbeard. It's said that Sabo practically has even more influence now than even Dragon himself, from whom we get a new epithet, the Hangyakuryu, or Rebellion Dragon. This is a fitting title for Sabo, as it refers to Sabo as an emperor, putting him on the same pedestal as Luffy, one of the now new four emperors. As this man points out with a mask, bearing the kanji for rebellion. This man claims that the era is changing, which is an illusion we've seen too many times in the series, including from Roger himself, with the swell of an era being an unstoppable change that will swallow the entire world. The times and the eras are changing, and we are finally approaching the One Piece itself. Now we delve into the final saga of One Piece.